Um, yeah, so today I'm going to continue our series on uh, the book of Psalms and focusing in on praying them out. Um, we're going to be talking about the 77th Psalm today, and it's, uh, it gets into um, pretty quickly times of trouble and distress. And so I kind of thought I would start off uh, a little bit lighter um, and uh, more jokey, because uh, I think it could kind of set a lighter tone for things. And so um, my kids, I've told them this story um, about distress and trouble, um, and they like it. And so I said, okay, maybe I'll tell it to the congregation about the first time I ever asked out a girl. It was very distressful for me. It was very, I was, it, it was, it was not pretty, and I'm about to share and open my heart to you. And uh, it is okay to mock me at this because it was, I don't know, do you, do, you, do you ever think when you go to heaven that there might be a video of your life and you go, I really hope we've deleted some scenes? <laughs> this probably is one of my scenes, right? So I was in 10th grade. I was, uh, this is going to be very shocking, but in junior high, I was kind of nerdy and academic and wasn't doing so well with the ladies. And so get into high school and it was like 10th grade and there was this girl I liked and well, I just, I just decided Friday night's the night I'm going to ask her. And uh, I was at this party, and uh, I got to say, I didn't rehearse the lines or, you know, like, what do you say? And as it got close, I just started freaking out. Like, I just, I started sweating so profusely. I could, my heart was racing so bad that I thought she, she should surely reject me just for the gross sight in front of her face. I was like, what, what, is he in a pool or something? Like, this, this was just like, I, I was just like, so I finally got to the moment, and I got up the nerve, and I looked at her, and, you know, mind you, I've, I've never been on a date, right? Like, this is, this is how things have been going in my life. And I don't know what to say exactly, so I just start talking. And it was not smooth at all. Again, probably surprising for some of you. But I was just like, oh, the, so, um, yeah, uh, so I was, I don't, I just think, like, Hey, so would you maybe want to be my girlfriend? Right? Just skip everything that might make sense. Do you want to go out casual, smooth? Just do you want to be my girlfriend? That was it. And I got to tell it was it was troubling. It was so stressful. And uh, so, but then you're like, now you wait. And she looks me dead in the eye and she goes, I'll think about it. And I was like, oh. You, I don't even know. That might be worse than no. Like, what I'm experiencing right now is so bad, and I'm so nervous that, like, this is no. But later on in the party, she, she kind of initiated a little handhold. My physics teacher used to call it interdigitating. And so uh, I said, oh, I think we got her answer. But we, she made me wait till the next day. And so that was my first, my first, uh, first date, first girl, girlfriend. And uh, it was not pretty by any means. And I will say on the serious side, um, part of like that, what I was just describing is like, you know, you're waiting for the outcome. Will she say, yeah, will she, whatever. But I got to say that the distress that was being created in myself was because I was super insecure, right? It wasn't like I asked and I just floated it out there. It was like, I was like so heavily invested, like, in how bad I was as an option. Like, I'm, I'm going like, I don't know, man. I may never go on a date. I may never go out with a girl. I may never. I was playing out these scenes, and I was so insecure. And I think that's a real thing. And I don't know, like, I think most of us in life just kind of got to look at that and make sure that you, you find out who you are, your identity in Christ. And you got to, like, learn how to walk confidently. If you're not if you're, not in, if you're in, dealing with insecurity, it affects your friendships, it affects your relationships. Like when you're insecure, when you, it's hard to be who you are, right? When you're insecure, you're always wondering what other people are expecting of you and you try to perform and become that which they do. It can affect your job interviews, it can affect the way you work, act in church. You can be an insecure churchgoer, like you come in and you go, I don't know how they're supposed to act in church and all of a sudden you're insecure and you're like, you're trying to study the other people to learn like the culture of like, how do I fit in? And so insecurity is a real distress and it is something you can turn to God for. So today I'm going to be continuing our series. It's on the book of Psalms, like we said, and Psalms, of course, has a lot of songs written in it. Um, I think that's 
interesting that when we translate the Bible, we, we haven't even tried to translate it into song, right? Like we haven't, like we're not singing these. Uh, some people do, I'm sure, but in general, we're reading them for content. But some of these, like instinctively, we do know when we're going through hard times, don't you, don't you just see naturally that people turn to songs, right? Like I was thinking about, uh, you ever like having, a, having one of those times and you, you turn to, hello, it's me. I was wondering after all these, right? Don't musicians naturally write out their feelings and then don't we like connect with them on a, on a song basis, right? Like people are, it's natural to do that. And the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, they were doing that. These were Psalms, they were songs, uh, but they were also prayers and poems. And so our emphasis, uh, you know, in this series, we'll, we'll, we'll do different things, of course, here and there, but it's not to try to teach you every single thing that the Psalms covers, content-wise, all the information. But honestly, more our heart, like at the pastoral level, is really that you start engaging with them in a prayerful way. We want you to start applying this and start praying out the Psalms and praying out scriptures in your everyday life, right? We've learned that we come to church on Sunday and sometimes it's like, hey, you, we all come kind of needy, but what we can offer in a one-time thing is not meant to get you through a week, right? What we're trying to do in this series is to give you equipment and tools so that during the week you can connect with God on a meaningful level. And so that's kind of the, the basis of this. So, um, so today I'll be discussing the 77th Psalm and how I engage with it after reading it and talking to God about it many years ago. And while I was doing that, I'm kind of a prop guy today. Um, I've got some props here. Uh, I had this imagery come and I started thinking about it. And so uh, I want to talk to you about power sanding first. And um, so I got a piece of wood and a power sander. And have you guys ever sanded anything? It's yeah, it's pretty fun. Um, and so you got the power sander, you got a piece of wood. Um, I guess as I was playing, I, again, I don't even know where this came from. It was just a thought. And as I prayed about it and played it out, I go, ah, this, this was helpful to me. And so I'll, I'll, I'll do it in church um, as an example, hopefully. Helps us remember and helps things stick. But in this case, this is like a, a piece of wood that looks like it was pressure treated. So maybe I was using it for something outside. But let's say, you know, I sawed it. And now there's this rough edge. And let's say I wanted to use this for like a, just an outdoor shelf or something. Well, you really wouldn't want a rough edge. And I was thinking, you know, the rough edge is kind of like how we get. You ever like, and, it, and it's rough to the touch, right? It can hurt a little bit. Do you ever like become self-aware that something's happening in your life? Maybe you're distressed, you're going through something. But when somebody else comes near you, it's like, oh, oh you're kind of going through something. Oh, you're, it's, you're rough to the touch. Um, I had one happen this week, not proud of it, but I thought I would share in an effort to be transparent and real. Um, one of my children this week had a nice full bowl of macaroni and cheese and was not paying close attention to what they were doing and they were trying to do something else. And then the mac and cheese just got dumped everywhere. And it was just like, it was on a chair and it was dripping. It was like super liquidy too, right? So it was like, it's on the floor. And um, honestly, I had a pretty negative reaction. I wasn't like, you know what? Here's an opportunity to serve you, child. <laughs> to clean up after you and make some more mac and cheese. I got like just, mm, it was just a moment. And as far as my recollection, I didn't say anything that was maybe wrong. But I'll be fully honest, the way I said it was hard and rough and wrong. And I'm, I feel bad about it because I was like, you weren't paying attention. And I could see, it was like my wood example, that I was rough. And that if you came into contact with me, this was not pleasant to you. This was painful to you, and it was painful to my child. And so I go, oh, man, that was not, a, like, I could have just been like, okay, you know, like, let's, we got to clean it up. That's why we have dogs, apparently, right? Like, so we just, 
you do what you got to do and we figure it out. Like I could have just been so much. So I realized that I have things in my life and it bubbled up in that moment and I became rough to the touch. So that's, I'm looking at us as maybe a piece of wood and like things happen in our lives and they, they come across and we become rough. We become rough around the edges. Some of it's mental and emotional things are happening. And, but when we come into contact with other people, it can be painful to the touch. And I was thinking about that's the Psalms is the way I'm looking at it is like God's going, I kind of have a way that we can work through some of this and we can smooth you out as a person. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, so it's like God is the power sander. And, uh, and so you can sit there if you're the piece of wood and you can kind of get one of those block sanders and try to do all the work yourself. It's a lot slower and it's a lot more work and it's probably less precise. Then you get the power sander, and then if you know, you could use this for whatever. Maybe you buy a used dresser and you want to paint it. You, you got different things you want to do. But for the rough side, the way this thing works is you got it plugged into electricity. It's got a power. You don't really do a study if you get one of these on how the motor works, right? Like not the average person. No, you just go, how do I work it? All right, so you, you, you get a piece of sandpaper, kind of like it's got a Velcro thing on there and you press the button. This is my kind of tool, right? Like, we're working with a little bit of simplicity here, right? And uh, so this is what, oh yeah. Get a little circular motion going there. And this is abrasive, right? And the goal here is um, to use this motion to brush off the, to clean off the sand, uh, the, the rough parts on the edge here, right? And so, but here's the thing, I've, I've watched more than my share of HGTV. It's kind of, a, it's kind of a thing, I need to work on it. But every time I see them when they're giving you the basic instruction, they're, like, they're saying this one thing, you gotta let the sander do the work, right? So it's doing this motion and the impatience that we have says, push it harder and grind it in there but you can actually push so hard that now the motion doesn't actually happen, right? And so you're not letting the part that's supposed to help you do the work, right? And so what you're supposed to do is just kinda let it do the work. Oh yeah. Just listening to your, your AirPods and you just, it's doing the work, it's doing the circles. My job is just to connect with it. Even right now, that's already smoother. Right, and so that's kind of the, the picture I have of us and God. And in the Psalms, I feel like he's numerous times, he's going, I'd love to connect with you, and I'd love for us to do a thing together, and I do the work. Your part is supposed to be work, but there's a part that I'm supposed to do, and if you'll let me do it, and stop pressing so hard, and let me do my part, I'll get out the, the smooth edges. I'll, I'll make you smooth on the rough edges, right? He wants to work on me as a father where when the milk is spilled, I don't lose my mind, right? So, um, so that's, there's a part in that that I play and there's a part that's working. There's a part that God works. And I, I saw this as part of the Psalms. So I wrote down some things, just kind of mostly read this here for a bit here um, when I was praying this week. Psalm seems to be full of stories of the rough parts of life. Mike told us last week about the lamenting, the expressing, and, and there's a lot of that, and also the praising. But it seems to be talking about the messiness of life, how things get dirty and messed up, and, and how do we do that? And um, we see in the Psalms that the Israelites did decide to deal with these things. They didn't just gloss them over. They didn't just go, oh, you're feeling this way? You should just not think about it. You should just, no, they actually had, uh, I was looking in Amos, there's a, an allusion to like back in the day, different cultures and, and the Israelites seemed to employ professional mourners even, like to connect with people when they were going through things. So they were very much about, we see it in the New Testament, um, there's an encouragement that when somebody's weeping, like we know uh, our instinct probably as Americans is to tell them an intellectual truth that will help them not weep, right? We go, oh, you know what would help while you're really sad 
is to know this truth, and so you, you need to not be sad. And yet, there seems to be a different process that the Bible lays out when we're going through it with other people. But sometimes we got to say, is God's, are we doing your process? Are we in? Are we engaging? And I think the main thing here that I want to say is just God is saying in the distress, he wants us to go to him right up front. These Israelites did not dance around the issues. David, a man after God's own heart, second king of the nation of Israel. Stories are written about him. How many times did he write and, and give us instruction on the bad things in life and how to work through it? And so we see this all over the place. I think sometimes I was thinking about this, that we've gotten to the place as a culture where we think, okay, I've got this hard thing, so what I'll do is I'll pray to God to get me out of it. And that's it. And while we're in it, we go, well, I'm just waiting for it to get out of it. And almost like we go, we're not living until we get out of the hard part. But I got to say, I understand that there's certain things we want to get out of, and we pray for deliverance from these things. But what about the time and the waiting? You know how many Psalms were written by David in caves while he was waiting to get to his established kingdom that God had promised him? Right? How many times while we're waiting on deliverance, what do I do with the internal battle while I'm waiting for the external deliverance? How much more of life is what's happening in our head, in our hearts, in our emotions, in our soul while we're waiting for God to come through in just a, a, like a deliverance sort of situation? Of course we pray for the deliverance, but we have to be connecting with God on all that's going on in the meanwhile. So what about you? Do you have distress in your life? Is there anything that maybe you should, you're, it's going on, it's in your mind, it's in your heart, but you haven't really officially even taken it to God yet? You haven't really gone through and prayed out a psalm and connected with him and see what his heart is? Do you have distress? Are your mind and emotions troubled at times? Anybody ever struggle with anxiety or depression? Is there anybody that's a perfectionist who feels like a failure because you see your flaws so clearly? This can cause a lot of distress. Anybody who's uh, distressed about their health? What about an unresolved conflict with someone you love? Is there someone, is there someone you love, even when you become Christians, I feel like sometimes the, the distress can actually get bigger you become a Christian and you go, oh man, I love God. God's grace is the best thing in this life. And then all of a sudden you start to have a burden and you start caring about people who don't know that yet. Is there anybody in your life that you absolutely love who doesn't know that God sent his son to atone for all their sins? Does that hurt your heart? Somebody in your family not walking out the life that you think is best for them? Do you have a distress at your work situations or do your finances ever stress you out? Like it's getting super quiet. Everyone's like, oh, go back to the jokes. <laughs> but what do we do until these things come? Do we look to the one who has overcome the world or are we always just focused on the fact that while we're in this world, we are going to have trials, we are going to have trouble, we're going to have persecution? Or can we take those things to God and learn how to live you know, abundantly in this life before we see um, a, a deliverance of those situations. I believe Psalm gives us these help in times of trouble while we're waiting. I believe God has us covering this book in this series um, because he wants to connect with us more regularly about the things that are going on in our life. I think he'd like to be um, smoothing out some of these rough edges rather than us just trying to cope in a life daily not engaging with him. And I think Psalms is part of that. Um, again, 15 years ago, I believe that God spoke to me. I was reading through the Psalms. I had one of these, um, like a daily reading plan. I try to read through the Bible in a year. And it just so happened on this one day that it was the 77th Psalm. And um, it was unique kind of what happened. I felt like as I was reading it, it actually started dividing. Like I could almost see divisions in it. And it divided into three sections in my mind. And um, I felt like the sections were, were God trying to connect with me and help me. Someone that I had loved very dearly had just died. And I was kind of in a mess. 
I wasn't actively talking to him at this point. I was reading the scripture and I was open to him and I felt like this was him reaching out. And when it split into the three parts, I, I saw like the, a heading in each section and the heading um, spelled, it spelled a word. I don't feel like I intentionally, sometimes you do that when you're a preacher, you try to make acronyms to make them stick. I don't feel like I did that. I felt like God did that for me. And it, um, the acronym spelled the word car, C-A-R. The first section was C, then it was A, then it was R. And I felt like he was kind of telling me, with the trouble you're in, with the distress, if you get in the car, it will help you to get movement out of the situation. And so that's kind of how it came to me. And so I want to read to you this 77th Psalm. Um, it was... I won't tell you a ton about it. I don't even think that's what we're supposed to be doing here this morning. But I will tell you one thing. It was, uh, we saw a video last week on kind of some of the structure, how it was written. And so this was written by someone named Asaph. Um, and Asaph was a, uh, one of the worship leaders under David in Israel. And I wanted to bring that up because to me that was very encouraging. That we have a nation, a huge church, a chosen people of God, and their worship leader is leading and writing out this song of what to do when we're in trouble, right? It's like, it's, it doesn't even give specifics. Some of the psalms you'll see as you're researching, uh, they're very specific. It'll be like, David wrote this, and it's about when Absalom was chasing him, this, and you get very specific. You don't really get this with this psalm, but what we get was this was the worship leader of Israel talking about in trouble, and something in me says that we're supposed to be a bit more open in leadership is that it's not that once you become a leader in church that all of a sudden your troubles cease. That all of a sudden we're just like all the time, I believe that God loves us and our grace and truth and mercy. That these things are always following us and God is good all the time. But to say that in this life, in this realm, that there are no troubles and there are no things that are on our mind and our emotions and our heart, that we don't get sad, that we don't feel things, I feel like it's a lie. And we need to like just, like the Israelites did, just go, let's deal with these things out in the open. Okay? So here's a 77th Psalm written by Asaph. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Salah. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Selah. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. Can you already even sense that this prayer was helping and shifting the internal atmosphere? Can you sense it in the words? Can you see it happening? You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph, Salah. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. That's the 77th Psalm. And again, it broke into three, three categories in my mind. 
Uh, again, I could, this isn't like me, I studied it, and like he intentionally, the author broke it into these, no, it was more like how it happened um, with me as I was praying. Um, the C in the car stands for cry out. That became pretty apparent right away. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he, I cry. And uh, I don't really think that this is 100% gotta be I cried tears, though I think some, a lot of times that probably was part of it. It's more of a cry out to God. And I will say this, my observation is I feel like there's a big difference in what they were doing and what we do when we cry out. He said, Asaph said, I cry out to God. And I think sometimes we've gotten in the habit of we just cry out complaining. We're just in pain, and so we just yell at whoever's passing by, and we let them know we're in discomfort. And I think there's a very difference in crying out to God and just kind of doing what I just said, right? But the whole verbiage, the whole words used here in the whole first section to me, uh, the first six verses to me was Asaph, and it was all crying out. I, I know there was already some remembering in there, and there were some other things, but man, the words, when I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. There was this um, freedom to express before God, I'm in pain, I'm moaning, I'm crying out. And I think sometimes we don't do this effectively in our culture. And I think, here, here's part of the problem if you get into church for too long, is you think that these things are wrong and sinful even, and you need to counteract them with Scripture instead of just expressing them. See, I, I believe that your feelings were meant to be expressed. And so I would say, I, I felt like I had to tell you this, there is a big difference between feeling alone and believing in your heart that God has left you or forsaken you. Right? I, I think if... the Many times in life, we go through a hard time, a distressing thing, and one thing is we go, we feel alone in our suffering. And I think it's okay to go to God and say, God, I feel alone. I know you said, it, of course we're going to pray the scripture out to him, but the way that I see the crying out part is like, we've got this thing inside of us, and it's almost like we're exhaling, and when we do that, we create space for God to come in and do what he wants to do. But if we sit there and we're going, man, I went through this thing, no one seems to understand, no one seems to care, we start to feel very isolated, and then we come across the scripture that says, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, and now we try to pound that into the fact that we still feel alone. And I'm telling you that I think that there's something valuable in the crying out to God, God, I know, I know you have, but, but I feel this way, I'm hurting. I thought it was supposed, you know, what's go you, you're crying out. And so that's what I got was when I went through this loss, I felt like I was like, it's okay to have feelings about it. You don't have to like right now be laughy. And, you know, you can, you can, you can share those with me, okay? Um, that's the C is cry out. Um, the second thing that I felt like God showed me was there seems to be this next section of questions, and I feel like the A in car was ask the questions. Again, I think in church sometimes we get so used to people saying this is the right answer that we, we stop asking the questions. We just go tell me the answers. And I feel like whenever you go through tough times, it is a natural internal thing to start going, oh, to start pondering. And I feel like it's actually healthy because the Bible, you'll see many times that God encourages us to ask ask, seek, knock. And so long as we're asking in context of God, I think this is a very healthy thing because I feel like when you legitimately are in a conversation with God and you ask, that he comes and he answers. Now, so you see all of these questions. Now, I don't think all the times the answers sound like what we thought they would sound like, right? Do you ever read through some of the disciples asking God a question, Jesus, and they, he just answers something like seemingly completely random and like, hey, we're over here, Jesus. What conversation are you in? Sometimes when we ask God, I feel like he's going to ask the questions. I feel like God is so loving and so caring about us that he goes to the real question, the deeper one, right? So why did you allow that to happen can be a question or it can be an accusation. 
I feel like a lot of times in our prayer life, we can even go, God, well, when we say, why did you allow that to happen? We're actually saying, I don't believe, you know, I don't, I don't know. Like you didn't, you could have controlled this and you didn't. It's more of an accusation. Which, by the way, if you take it into a question, I feel like God will come to the rescue. God, did you, is this something that I was supposed, you know, like you, again, a, a question offers up the fact that I've emptied myself and I'm now looking for you to fill me. So I, I see that as a pattern with A. And lastly, there's an R. And R is about remembering God's incredible power and his incredible goodness. I feel like both of these are evident in the 77th Psalm. Man, I saw you. God, your mighty works. Oh, man, you, you didn't go around. You went through the water. You know what I mean? Like, you, they're, they're pointing to things, and they're remembering the power and the goodness, right? Like, he could separate. It looks like we're talking about the Red Sea. You could, man, where there seemed to be no way, God, you did a way. You created this. You're powerful. And, and I feel like that, that gets exciting. And so if you're asking God the questions, and all of a sudden you start remembering who he is, you got to, like, open yourself and go, Lord, who are you? And when, he said, when you start to remember how big and how powerful God is, all of a sudden the problem starts shrinking, right? Like I think when, when we don't engage with God on these things, the problems stay massive and we let them be big and weighty. And when we turn to God and we go, man, you, God, you, you created the universe. You got, you got lightning things and you got sea things and water party things. And so for me, the remembering is, Sometimes there's just scripture and things that you know bring you alive, stories you read in scripture. And other times it's personal things. I mean, you got a list? You got things that you could talk about that God would show that he's been powerful and faithful in your life? Because I think when we're in trouble, when we got this distress, one lie that we're going to be tried is sold in our mind and our heart is that he doesn't care about you anymore. And when you start to remember his goodness it starts to bring in this influx of hope again. Oh, no. I don't, that problem isn't as big as I thought because if God wants to do anything, he can do it right now. And I didn't do something to mess it up because God sent his son before I even did any. He loves me. He's crazy about me. So you start to do those sort of things and you start to remember God's goodness and all of a sudden the hope starts to come. Now, I did feel like I needed to emphasize we can't leave out the R. We can't leave out the part where we remember God's goodness. It's the part that really fills us and ends it, right? We saw in the video that there seems to be this pattern over and over again in Psalms where it's almost like up front there's more lamenting and there's more crying out and there's more expression of the woes of this life. But on the tail end, there's meant to be more, oh, God. And it's not like forced. It's like, oh. It's like you start looking at your problems and go, oh, something's coming for you, right? Like you start to get hope because of you're remembering God's goodness. And so if you leave out the R in car, I feel like it just is ka, and you start to, and you go into this cycle and you sound like an annoying little bird, ka-ka. You cry out and you ask the questions and you cry out and you ask, ka-ka, ka-ka. And then there's no God part in there. You just got big problems. You got big questions and you got big crying. And then, but the, the R part is like important to let God be come in the re, like be the savior that He always wants to be in our lives, and so this is the car. Um, so what I've done is again uh, the the emphasis in this series is to get you to engage with God in your prayer. I've created a template of the seventy seventh Psalm. On your way out today, the usher is actually going to hand you one, and I'm going to encourage each and every one of you to write it out in a personal way. There's a C, and that stands for cry out. And I'm going to ask you prayerfully to make this a prayer, a personalized prayer like they were doing here, and say, Lord, here's my distress. Here's what I'm crying out about. And then when you're praying, any questions that come up, I want you to write that in the A part. And then on the R part, I want you to remember God and his goodness, and I want you to write it out. And then I want you to pray out your prayer. So I want you to ride the car and see if it doesn't help you. Again, the whole goal here is to get you to engage with God. I'm going to invite Rita Butler up right now. Um, as one of our church leaders, I engaged with her uh, earlier in the week, and I kind of told her what I was doing, and I said, hey, would you mind modeling this for us so we can see, yeah, see what this would look like? Um, 
because it's kind of vague, right? So how do I write my own psalm? And so she has the template that you have, and she did what I'm asking you to do, which is the C-A-R, the cry out, the ask, and then the remember. And then I've asked her um, to read it um, for you so that you can see her personal prayer to God using the 77th Psalm. All right, I feel like it must be pretty rough because God's given me a lot, <laughs> a lot of these things. She's building but a whole fence in the back. There so, we go, yeah, there we yeah. go. Um, but the one that the Lord brought to mind to share today happened about two weeks and five years ago. So, and I've gotten proper permissions to share this. I'm just going to go ahead. You're going to know from what I've written here. I cry out to you, God. I know you'll hear me. I can't do this on my own. It's just too hard. As I lay here in the dark at my son's hospital bedside once again, this time hearing his piercing cough, the sound of the IV beeping, not knowing what the days ahead will bring. It seems like it would be the, the worst part, but no, I cannot sleep. I cannot shut off my brain. All it will do is imagine him in that pool, frantically trying to resurface, but losing that battle. Feeling that today would be the day he will die. Then unconscious, lying at the bottom. Then my other boys panicked, struggling to get him out and breathing again. You say, you bring rest. But will you ever make these thoughts stop? Lord, why this child again? He's been through so much. I love you and have served you for years. Why have you allowed tragedy to strike my family once again? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your, your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made, made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph, and... You have watched over Christopher all of his 16 years. When he was born 12 weeks premature and needing a ventilator to survive, you were with him. Your strength was with us. Through the pneumonia at four and burst appendix at 13, you, you, were, you upheld us with your mighty right hand. Through the years of struggle in other areas, you have given your abundant wisdom. You have cared for us and led us like your beloved sheep by the prayers and help of your people. We are a family blessed beyond measure. Selah. Amen. Well, thank you. Can you see how this... Uh, process is a little bit helpful where you start out kind of just expressing and not you're not like really saying this is a fully believe but it's like I got to get this out and then how you end up in the right place God you've been faithful he's always faithful but understand that when the distress is pounding you in the face that you don't always feel that and so it seems to help to release that I don't feel it right now and you ask the question, oh, let me get back to that remembering. Let me get back to the, you are faithful. And it helps you to actually line up your mind and your heart with your spirit, right? Because your spirit always knows, right? So I find this to be very helpful. So I've got one last thing uh, to ask of you. And um, it has to do with knives, of course. Um, and so Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen is kind of a, uh, I would say a famous Bible verse. And people that don't go to church, use it. Um, it says iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. And um, 
you know, I tried to look up, okay, so back in the day, the Israelites, how did they sharpen iron? And I, it was really inconclusive how iron would sharpen iron. And so I thought I would uh, use an example that I feel like God has shown me a little bit over the years. Um, I was a restaurant manager, and um, we had this all-you-can-eat uh, cafeteria-style buffet. And one thing that we realized was people ordered way more than they could eat. And as a restaurant manager who food costs matters, it made you nuts. And so certain things you did, like with the roast beef, roast beef was expensive, and people would be like, I won't give me some more of that. So one thing that was really important was you had to sharpen your knife. And I would try to, you get your little fork in there, you try to, you try to sh I, I wanted to see, I wanted to be able to see through the roast beef. That's how, that's, a, that's how thin I wanted it. It actually tasted better when you got it thin. I mean, you, everyone, of course, you think, give me that, give me that slab, right? But that's, it's not steak. It's not really meant to be <laughs> chewing for like 20 minutes, right? So this actually tasted better and it really cut down your food costs and your waste. So, but to do that, your knife would always become dull. And so I look at this. This is an iron. I, I guess typically you look at steel on steel, but there's an iron component, right? So it's, it's an alloy, but there's iron, and it is iron sharpening iron. And I guess the thing that I always think about when I, when I think about this Proverbs is, um, I think when we think iron sharpens iron, most of us think there's just two knives sitting there being happy, talking to each other. And it's really not the picture I ever see of how one thing gets sharpened, it seems like there are always two different things, right? And so in here, we would, typically it was a, kind of fun. Like we would try to actually do little dances and the people would be like, ooh. Like while they're waiting in line, you try to entertain them with a little, but basically you're, you're using an abrasive little substance. You know, you could use a different grinding thing or different ways. I think in all the movies, right, they superheat it and then they put it on a rock, and then they just pound it, right? So there seems to be, though, an abrasive part to ironing, sharpening iron, right? There's, you got to come across something that's different than you, and you got to get rubbed a little bit, and there's an abrasion part. And, but the end result, I believe, is that you become sharper. And I believe that that is partly what the uh, proverb here is telling us, is that um, in life, if you want to do a good job of being sharp, not being rough, that you're, not only are we to pray to God, but you are going to have to have people in your life. And the people are going to be different than you, and they're, they're very likely going to be abrasive, right? So if you come to me and say, man, I was in church, and this person is, I was like, well, yay, it's church, right? Like, yeah, like, probably everybody's abrasive to everybody else because they're different. And it's like, well, I think I'm right all the time, and you're thinking something different. Woo! It's called being people, right? And so, but what happens is when God puts us in place with them, they're like, I want you to connect with that person. And you go, whoo, whoo. All of a sudden, if you allow them to play a role in your life, then all of a sudden you become sharper, and you become more effective at your life. And I believe in church, this is a, a thing that maybe we leave out a lot. It's like, how do I, in this tough time, where do I go to get sharpened? Where do I go to be engaged in? And so um, the last thing I, I will leave to you um, is I'm telling you, I'm, I'm encouraging you to take the paper and to do your best. What a great job Rita did, really trying to do the, the car. I want you to try to do that. And I'm going to ask you to try to share that with one person. I believe that's, a, that's the abrasive part. I, I will tell you it's uncomfortable. I mean, Rita just got uncomfortable. She had to kind of like go to a, the deep place and wonder if you'll judge her or wonder if you'll understand and wonder if you'll value her heart and when she gets vulnerable. And that's the risk part of life when you get another person is can I trust them? And I would say um, we're supposed to be in relationship with other people. And it's just... It's not just love God, it's love God, love people. And if that's the case, it's also like let God love you and let other people love you, right? It's this whole um, methodology, it's a whole way of thinking of how God is like, there's just one church, there's just one body, and I'm part of that, and so you can't, you can't say you're connecting with me and you're not connecting with people. God would say that's just not the right thinking, right? He doesn't think like that. He thinks in terms of unity, and so he wants us to engage, and so... Maybe this happens, maybe you got a small group or someone that you really reach out to and trust, and I want you to try your best to write this out and say, I, I want to just share this with you and s see how it goes, right? Maybe it's your, 
you got a small group, a missional community, worship team. You, you just got somebody, maybe it's a person. Um, you're free to reach out to me with it. Um, and then I'm going to pray here in a second. And then uh, I've asked our leaders, I'm going to dismiss, but I've asked a couple leaders to stay here because it's possible that whatever is distressing you or whatever your trouble is, you want to connect and maybe tell someone here on the altar um, and, and just get some ministry time. And maybe you want to try to go through the process with somebody even up here. There are going to be a couple people here for you to do that. And so um, I hope, again, that this encourages you a little. And I, more than that, I hope that you take and just try to engage with God in every area of your life that's troubling as you just try to work it out with him. And always get to the end where you remember how good and how powerful he is. Let me pray and then we'll, we'll do that. Heavenly Father, you are good. Heavenly Father, you are faithful. You are always faithful to complete that which you begin, Lord. Um, thinking about all the times in Scripture that uh, you just came through, even in this passage. It was talking about the Red Sea, man. These people... They were crying out from Egypt for a while. And then you took them on an incredible journey. And it looked like they had come to their end, like a sea had stopped them. And their enemy was coming and was going to just completely destroy them. But you were involved. And the end result was the sea had to give way. And they had to get across because you were good and you were powerful. Lord, I thank you that um, we can look to you and we can look to the cross as you have created a way for all who would believe on you. Lord, that we, we all cry out, Lord, we want to be in heaven forever. And you sent your son as a way to separate, to create a way for us to get from here to there where there seemed to be no way. I thank you for your heart as a father that you would give your son. And, and Lord, I just thank you for the heart of Jesus where he had every authoritative right when they, were, when they were unjustly crucifying him to call down a legion of angel warriors, and he chose not to. I thank you that you are good and you are powerful and you are above and beyond all that we can see, all that we can hope, all that we can dare ask. I thank you that you see our distresses and our troubles. I thank you that you care. I thank you that you don't turn us away, that you actually invite us to prayerfully talk to you about these things, Lord. I thank you that you, you help us. You're, you smooth out the edges in our life, Lord. We don't always like the way we feel, but we feel them. And I thank you that you've given us ways to, to cope and deal. And Lord, I pray more and more that we would do them in relationship and in context of you, Lord. We ask for your leading on that, Lord. I pray that in our distress and trouble, we would just continually turn to you in prayer. Lord, I, I pray that we would be comfortable relationally to express what's going on. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open so that you could pour into us all your goodness, all your love, all the things you want to say, Lord, that we would just be open. Lord, I thank you that you are ever present in our times of trouble. I thank you that you care and that you continually let us know you're in if we would but just ask, if we would just invite and have a real conversation with you. You're, you're good beyond even what is understandable. We thank you. We praise you. And Lord, I ask for right now, as people maybe go through this process, Lord, that it wouldn't be just a stirring of negative things, but Lord, it would, be, it would be a thing that they come out on the other side. Lord, it would be more and more stories of your goodness and your deliverance. And Lord, there would be more life that we wouldn't wait till the end of the story when everything turned out right to start living. But Lord, with your help, we would live an abundant life all the days of our life. Lord, that we would invite you in and ask for your help. Father, I just ask for your help in every situation, in every heart that's watching online or that's here today, that they invite you in, that, Lord, you would just come to the rescue, that you would answer, that you would sit with them, that you would be a safe space, that you would listen, and, Lord, when, when their ears are ready, that you would just speak those words of life that only you could do. 
Lord, I thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. With that, I, I bless you. I dismiss you. The usher has the templates for you to work on them. And if I could have a couple of you leaders, come on up front. And uh, again, if you're ready to uh, just talk to someone or you want ministry really for anything, but maybe something stirred up today, uh, they'll be here for you today. So God bless you. You are dismissed.